Hello students. In the last two lectures, we have discussed about some properties of ideals of rings of fractions. So in this lecture, I will further uh, discuss about certain properties of ideals of rings of fractions. I will start my lecture with some of the exercises. So this is the first exercise. If S is multiplicatively closed subset of ring R and I and J are ideals of ring R, then we have the following properties. S inverse commutes with sum of ideals. S inverse commutes with product of ideals, with intersection of ideals, with the radical of an ideal and with colon ideal. These ex this exercise is very easy to prove. Next is, suppose A is the ring of integers and P is ideal generated by 5 of ring A. Then we know that P is a prime ideal. So this exercise, is, this exercise asks to find all prime ideals of localized ring AP. We know that AP is nothing but S inverse A, where S is A minus P. Now we know that we have done in the last lecture that there is one-to-one -one correspondence between prime ideals of S inverse A and those prime ideals of A which do not meet S. So in this case, S is A minus P. So translating this correspondence in this special case, the result becomes there is one-to-one -one correspondence between prime ideals of localized ring AP and those prime ideals Q of A which are contained in P. So thus, prime ideal of, now look at this, this condition, Q intersection S is empty. In this case, there will be only one prime ideal of A which will not meet S. S here is A minus 5Z. So the prime ideal which does not meet A minus 5Z will be just 5Z. So thus, by this correspondence theorem, there will be only one prime ideal of AP, namely QP. Its elements look like A by S, where A is in 5Z and S is not in 5Z. This will be unique prime ideal of AP. Next exercise is, if M is A module and N and P are submodules of M, then colon ideal of n and p is equal to annihilator of n plus p mod n. So let x belongs to left hand side. So this means xp is contained in n. That is xp belongs to n for all p in p. This will happen if and only if xp plus n is equal to n. If and only if xp plus n is equal to n because n plus p mod n is a module. So if and only if x p plus n plus n is equal to n for all p in p and x in n. n plus n is n. So we can write n as n plus n for any n in n. So this means x belongs to an annihilator of n plus p mod n. So thus we have proved the equality of these two ideals. Next is let i be ideal of ring A and S be the set 1 plus i, which is one plus, which is the set this 1 plus x, x belongs to i. So we have to show in this exercise that S is multiplicatively closed subset of A and further we have to show that S inverse i is contained in Jacobson radical of S inverse A. Remember, Jacobson radical of a ring is intersection of all maximal ideals. So let us first of all see that 1 plus i is multiplicatively closed subset of A. This is very easy to see because if we take two elements uh, in S, 1 plus x and 1 plus y, then 1 plus x into 1 plus y will be 1 plus x plus y plus xy. And since x plus y plus xi will be element of i, so the product of two elements of S will remain in S. So thus S is multiplicatively closed subset of A. Next we prove that S inverse I is contained in Jacobson radical of S inverse A. So for this, first of all, let us recall that what is Jacobson radical of S inverse A? It is 
the set of all those elements a by s in s inverse a such that 1 minus a by s into b by t is unit in s inverse a for all b by t in s inverse a. This is one more uh, definition of Jacobson radical. Now we want to show that s inverse i is contained in Jacobson radical of s inverse a. So for this first of all we will take an element in s inverse i. Let that element be a by s. So this means a belongs to i and s belongs to s. s here is 1 plus i. Now we take an arbitrary element b by t in s inverse a. Now here s and t belongs to s. So we write s as 1 plus alpha and t as 1 plus beta where alpha and beta belongs to i. And we try to find out this expression. 1 by 1 minus a by s b by t. This will turn out to be 1 plus alpha plus beta plus alpha beta minus upon 1 plus alpha 1 plus beta. So this will be equal to some element of s upon some element of s. Now we know that units in s inverse a are elements of this kind. Thus, we have shown that this element is unit in S inverse A for all B by T in S inverse A. Hence, A by S belongs to Jacobson radical of S inverse A. So, S inverse I is contained in Jacobson radical of S inverse A. Next is this exercise. Let P be prime ideal of A and S be multiplicatively closed subset of ring A and p intersection s is empty set then there is isomorphism between these two local rings a p and s inverse a s inverse p now look at this ring this makes sense s inverse a is a ring and s inverse p will be prime ideal of s inverse a because p is a prime ideal of a which does not meet s so as we can localize s inverse a at prime ideal s inverse p so this exercise is this exercise shows uh, gives isomorphism between these two local rings so let us try to prove it so since p is a prime ideal which does not meet s so s inverse p is prime ideal so we write q as s inverse a minus s inverse p and b as s inverse q so this ring becomes bq we need to prove that these two rings are isomorphic. <laughs> so let, let us define f from AP to BQ by f of A by S is equal to A by S by 1 by 1. Now this makes sense because A by S belongs to B and 1 by 1 belongs to Q because Q is S inverse A minus S inverse P. So, since 1 belongs to S inverse, uh, belongs to A minus P, so 1 by 1 will belong to Q. Now, it can be shown easily that F is a ring homomorphism. Now, to, to prove that these two are isomorphic, we need to show that this map is 1, 1 and onto. So, let us prove onto. Now, any element of BQ will be of the form a by s upon b by t where a by s is in b and b by t is in q so a belongs to a s belongs to s s does not belong to p b does not belong to p and t belongs to s so now a by s by b by t we can easily see that this is equal to a t by b s upon 1 by 1 so this is equal to f a t by b s now f is 1 1 so if we show that a by s is in kernel f then f of a by s will be 0 of this and using these trivial observations we can see that kernel of f is 0 that is f is 1 1 so thus we have proved that a p is isomorphic to b q as rings next is Suppose A is Z6 and S is 1 bar, 3 bar, 5 bar. This is subset of A 
Now the question is, is S multiplicatively closed? So we can easily see that if we take any two elements of S, the product is in S, say 3 bar and 5 bar. 3 bar into 5 bar is 15 bar, which is 3 bar in Z6. Similarly, we can, we can see that by taking product of any two elements of S, the result again lies in S. So S is multiplicatively closed. So next exercise is to find rings of fraction S inverse A. So now by definition, S inverse A is A by S where A is in Z6 and S is in S. So it turns out to be this set. 0 bar by 1 bar, 0 bar by 3 bar, 0 bar by 5 bar and so on. Now we can easily see that 0, by, 0 bar by 1 bar is equal to all of these elements because elements 0 bar comma 1 bar is related to 0 bar comma 3 bar under the equivalence relation by which this rings of fraction ring of fractions is defined. Similarly, we can see that 1 bar by 1 bar is equal to all of these elements. So thus S inverse A contains only two elements, 0 bar by 1 bar and 1 bar by 1 bar. Next exercise is, if A is a ring with P as its prime ideal, and if each ring A localized at prime ideal P is integral domain, then is it true that A is also integral domain? So the answer is no. Let's see. Suppose A is Z6. We know that A is not integral domain. Now, the prime ideals of Z6, we take first prime ideal of Z6 as 2Z6, 2Z mod 6Z and second prime ideal to be 3Z mod 6Z. Now we try to find out A localized at P1 and A localized at P2. By the similar calculations which we have done in previous exercise, we can see that A localized at P1 turns out to be isomorphic to Z3 and A localized at P2 turns out to be isomorphic to Z7. Since Z3 and Z7 both are integral domains, so A localized at P1 and A localized at P2 are integral domains. But A is not integral domain. So if a ring localized at each of its prime ideal is integral domain, then A need not be integral domain. Now let us try to find the nil radical of ring S inverse A. So nil radical of ring S inverse A will be intersection of all prime ideals of S inverse A. Now this corollary says that if N is the nil radical of ring A, then nil radical of S inverse A is S inverse N. Now, S inverse N will be equal to S inverse intersection P, where intersection is taken over all prime ideals of A. Now, we know that S inverse commutes with intersection. So, this becomes intersection P, S inverse P. Now, we can break this intersection in two parts. We collect those prime ideals of ring A which do not meet S and those prime ideals of A which meet S. Now, remember that if P intersection S is non-empty, then S inverse P is nothing but S inverse A. So, this intersection is S inverse A. Hence, S inverse N becomes just intersection of S inverse P, where intersection is taken over those prime ideals of A which do not meet S. Now, by our correspondence theorem, we get that these are the only prime ideals of S inverse A. So thus, this is intersection of all prime ideals of S inverse A. Hence, this will be equal to nil radical of S inverse A. Thus, we have proved that nil radical of S inverse A is equal to S inverse N. Now, let M be finitely generated A module and S is a multiplicatively closed subset of A then this theorem proves that S inverse commutes with annihilator. That is, S inverse of annihilator of M is annihilator of S inverse M. Suppose M and N be A modules, then S inverse of annihilator of M plus N is equal to 
S inverse annihilator of M, intersection annihilator of N. Because if any element kills M plus any element of M plus N, then it will kill any every element of M as well as every element of N. Since S inverse commutes with intersection, so this becomes S inverse and high letter M intersection S inverse and high letter N. So this will be an high letter of S intersection M intersection and high letter of S inverse N. So this will be an high letter S inverse M plus N. Now, we have to prove this result for a finitely generated A module. So first of all, we will prove uh, this result if M is generated by a single element, say X. So M will be AX. Now, by considering the map from A to M, we can easily show that M is isomorphic to A mod and high letter of M as A modules. Thus, S inverse M will be isomorphic to S inverse A mod and high letter of M, which is isomorphic to S inverse A modul, modulo S inverse and high letter of M. So thus, an high letter of S inverse M will be equal to S inverse and high letter of M. So now, if M is finitely generated A module and let it be generated by set X1, X2, Xn, then M will be AX1 plus AX2 plus AXN. So by induction on N, we can prove the required result for this M. Similarly, we can prove that if N and P are submodules of A module M and P is finitely generated, then S inverse <coughs> of colon ideal n is to p is equal to s inverse n is to s inverse p. This is very easy to prove. So I am leaving the proof. Now, remember that if f is a ring homomorphism from a to b and q is a prime ideal of b, then contraction of q is also prime. Now the question arises that when every prime ideal of a is contraction of some prime ideal of b, that is, if P is a prime ideal of A, then when can I say that P is equal to QC, where Q is prime ideal of B? So, the next theorem gives a necessary and sufficient condition for the same. So, let F be a ring homomorphism from A to B and P is a prime ideal of A. Then P is contraction of some prime ideal of B if and only if PEC is equal to P. Here, E is extension with respect to this homomorphism F and C is contraction with respect to this homomorphism F. So let us see its proof. Now suppose P is contraction of some prime ideal of B. That is, P will be equal to QC for some prime ideal Q of P. So PEC will be QCEC. Now we know that QCEC is nothing but QC, so which is equal to P. So hence, one side is proved that if P is contraction of some prime ideal of B, then P E C is equal to P. Now let's prove the converse part. Suppose that P is prime ideal of A such that P E C is equal to P. Now we take S to be F A minus P. Clearly P will S will be multiplicatively closed subset of ring B. So I consider uh, a natural homomorphism G from B to S inverse B and let E dash be extension of any ideal with respect to G and C dash be contraction of any ideal of S inverse B with respect to G. Now consider extension of P under F. Since S is F of A minus P and PE is ideal generated by FP. So PE intersection S is empty. That means PE is ideal of B which does not meet S. So thus S inverse PE will be a proper ideal of S inverse B. What is S inverse PE? It will be PEE -E dash. It will be proper ideal of S inverse B. So, it is contained in some maximal ideal, say M of S inverse B. 
Now, we take Q to be M C dash. M is maximal ideal of S inverse B. So, we take contraction of M under G, M C dash, and we say it to be Q. Now, since contraction of prime ideal is prime, so Q is prime ideal of B. And we have this P E E dash, which is S inverse P E, is contained in M. So, Q, which is M C dash, will contain P E E dash C dash, which will contain P E, because I E C is always contained in I for any ideal I. Now, taking contraction with respect to F on both sides, we get that Q C contains P E C. P E C is given to be equal to P. So, we get that QC contains P. Now, M is prime ideal of S inverse P and MC dash is a prime ideal of P and MC dash intersection S is empty by correspondence theorem. So, Q intersection F A minus P is empty set. So, thus F inverse Q is contained in P. But what is F inverse Q? This is QC. So, QC is contained in P. In the previous slide, we have proved that QC contains P. So, combining these two, we get that P is equal to QC. Thus, we have shown that if P is prime ideal of A and PEC is P, then P is contraction of some prime ideal of B.